I told him I, I knew I was going to get the stop on already, and uh, I switched with Lucas because I didn't want to uh, intrude on Lucas. I thought I'd intrude on all of you instead, okay? Um, also, I was present at that Pi VC meeting, and that was fabulous. It was so good to be present and ha see the range of people who were out on the road, the maintenance, the planners, the engineers, all together, and to learn from that. And the other thing that he didn't mention that was so valuable was that we all went out on the highway as well, and we discussed the issues that we were out there. And I, that was it, was a, it was a very good process. So even though I don't get to ask any questions, but I'll do that anyway. Listen, I, I work for Natural Resources Canada, and uh, I'd like to say that Within the mandate of what I do, I see three responsibilities. Number one is to provide um, essential geoscience information where there are gaps and attempt to fill those gaps. Number two is essentially to come up with applied scientific methodologies, looking up for new scientific techniques which can be applied as well to end users. End users that we deal with commonly include the territorial government, industry, and communities. And the third area that uh, we typically try to improve on are to establish protocols. It was mentioned earlier, we have, for example, a standard legend for sufficient mapping and so forth, but when we're working on new scientific technologies, it's to try to establish best practices as well in terms of the methods that we're going to use when we go forward in applying those uh, to, to practical problems. So uh, I'd like to quickly say I have a long list of uh, of both our participants uh, on the project and uh, as well as um, direct end users uh, and, and in specifically, uh, I'm, uh, whoops, uh, that would include the uh, Department of Transport, the City of Yellowknife. Uh, for example, um, um, uh, in, uh, road inspectors for the Tibet to Contoito Road uh, as well, uh, including the industry part or, or end users as well, uh, collaborations with uh, BGC, EB Engineering, and actually um, quite, quite significantly the mentorship that we get from Chris Byrne, the um, uh, students that we have and the support that we get from Carleton University as well. So uh, what I'd like to talk about today is the fact that community and industry infrastructure are expanding throughout the extensive discontinuous permafrost zone of the Great Slave region. And however, relatively little is known about this climatically sensitive permafrost region. So this network of uh, collaborators, um, we, our goal is to provide essential information on permafrost conditions in this region for infrastructure and understanding permafrost conditions in a warming climate. I'm going to step through four examples today, and they're going to be quite cursory, but they'll include terrain mapping, ground subsidence, seasonal winter hazards, and then very briefly, a data set network for which I have an example in the poster as well, so I'll just touch on that briefly. Uh, essentially, I'm going to show sufficient geology and ice-rich terrain and uh, applied towards infrastructure route selection. The identification both using satellite radar as well as what's called LIDAR, which is uh, light detection and raging, which is an airborne methodology which produces a, a very high topographic digital elevation model and optical uh, photographs to go with those as well. That is for existing highway and infrastructure applications. The third one is the distribution and return frequency of overland ice. And this has become, I think this is going to be a very significant developing problem with warming temperatures, increased snowfall, increased precipitation. We see a change in hydrology, potentially more water flow occurring uh, during the course of winter. I think this is going to become a very significant issue. Uh, and we'll take a look at that, how we can apply that towards winter road routings. Lastly, we'll just very briefly touch on the significance of basically having data out there for people to use, air temperatures, ground temperatures, and so forth. We're, com we're now in a situation where we're being uh, asked very frequently, you know, do you have air temperatures up the, up the winter road? We need that for another purpose. Of course we have them. They're, they're co going out to clients all the time. Uh, so uh, the first example, terrain mapping. You know, it's one thing to work in a community like, for example, the city of Yellowknife, which is 30 square kilometers. In 30 square kilometers, I can take 200 air photos, sit down over a few weekends, and I can map that and have a sufficient geology map. This is a quarter million square kilometers. <laughs> 500 kilometers by 500 kilometers. 45% of the Northwest Territories is still unmapped. 
in terms of sufficial geology. And interestingly enough, it extends from this area of Great Slave up to Great Bear and essentially towards Tuktoyaktuk. Sure, the Mackenzie Delta region is well mapped, much of the rest of the region is not. How do you go forward in terms of understanding um, how, root selection, geoscience information, and permafrost if you don't have an understanding of the sufficial sediments? So this doesn't happen in two weeks. <laughs> it's quite a significant uh, issue, and we can't. And essentially, the approach we've taken here is to use uh, develop preliminary maps using um, um, uh, uh, satellite imagery, ground truth with fishing trips. I mean field trips, <laughs> Steve, <laughs> um, and so at this point, this is, a, this is the type of thing, what we need to know essentially is, we heard already, um, till blankets, you know, the till terrain, and as I pointed out previously, glacial lacustrine sediments in this region, they're thaw sensitive, they contain ice, there's a need to understand the distribution of that material and as it's associated with permafrost. So this is what we've developed so far. Uh, we have two that are released. These ones are going to be released by the end of the year. And what I've done is I've overprinted this with a network of infrastructure, both existing infrastructure and proposed infrastructure, so you can see this is how we were making decisions in terms of prioritizing where we were going to get our maps done. In fact, too, we're, in we're making sure that we're including communities. Uh, it, was, it was very important for us to get this map put in here, otherwise it would have been a blank. But because of uh, Bechico and the, the alternative road routes that could be here, we needed to get that done. And again, just want to show you illustratively how important this is. This is the Great Slave Uplands. The pink is bedrock, you know, you see over here, lots of rock. Well, down here, lots of clay. The blue is clay. And this is a picture right here. See the ice? That's Franklin Avenue, right? That was done, I think that was done in about 1977 or so. That's a photo a long way back. You can't dig that ice out. <laughs> All right. Uh, and here, um, this, is, this is our three alternative road routes, potential uh, uh, winter road routes from Betuco up to uh, Wati, I believe it is, right? And um, so the blue, this is uh, glacial lacustrine sediments. Uh, this is upland, this is on bedrock uh, with, a, with a till blanket. And so this, the, we wanted to get this map out as soon as possible. It's still in preliminary form. Nevertheless, it goes out because it could aid in making decisions with regards to route selection. So now the next thing I'd like to show is ice-rich terrain. Okay, you know, it's one thing to go to the Tuktoyaktuk coastlands, fly over that area and see pingos, thousands of pingos. Well, you come here, well, where's the ice-rich terrain? Where is it? How do you identify it? Would you believe it was here? And why would you know that? So what we did is we accessed, we, we, we got some, uh, well, we bought some LIDAR data. LIDAR had been flown for uh, Highway 3, so we, we purchased about half of it, and we looked at different ways in which we could use this LIDAR information. One of the things that came out that was so interesting was that we were able to identify this hill terrain. These are vegetated mounds, hills, they're lithalsis, it doesn't really matter what they are, but anyway, they're ice cored terrain. And uh, we were able to identify it. Certainly, you can see, here's the bedrock. The bedrock shows out nice and clearly. This is a digital elevation model. This is smooth, it's soil, this is bedrock. This, these are ice cored terrain. We cored them, we know they're ice cored. This is Highway 3. Highway 3 did, in fact, cut through part of that. I'll mention it went about, it's dropped about a meter over the last. Uh, Six years, I think it is. <laughs> so it's significant to know where this ice-rich terrain is. And it is hidden by the boreal forest. Now, once we were able to identify this on LIDAR, we could then go back to air photos and use the air photo mapping in order to, to, to see the distribution of this ice core terrain. This is as abundant as pingos in the Tuck coastlands. We map nearly 2,000 ice core terrain areas between Yellowknife and Bechico. Yes, there's a lot more ice in the region than we ever thought existed. This is not buried ice. It's a different type of ice, but it just shows how significant this is. And in fact, what, we've decided, what we looked at here is, well, can we see some of this? This is um, Stag Creek, and it is a problem area for the highway. There's a few other areas like this. These pink is the distribution of ice core terrain. As you can see, it runs within embayments and upstream channels, and much of this is, is within the first 10 meters 
above Great Slave Lake. It's, it's related to the silt and clay sediments during a uh, very more recent drawdown of that with, uh, with thicker uh, sediments. So we, we see an association, we're able to understand this, we can also identify it. Ground subsidence, I'm just going to move on to the, to the second example using satellite radar. You saw that image already from Lucas. You'll notice that indeed this is, there's a bump. There's a bump on Highway 3. <laughs> ah, yes. Um, anyway, <clears throat> so what we did there, I showed the examples for uh, Yellowknife. We, we used the same methodology using satellite uh, um, interfer or, uh, well, uh, satell satellite DNs are um, to take a look at its applications on Highway 3. So again, the subsidence. You see a fair bit of subsidence along this part of the highway. Uh, the blue, they, it is on bedrock. We have another set of maps that shows the bedrock terrain versus organic terrain. And what we did here, which I thought was quite interesting, and I haven't seen this done before, we then took the actual INSAR data along the center line of the highway and applied it in terms of a linear fashion so we could look and see how much uh, subsidence we saw over that four month period over different sections of the highway. So there's three centimeters of subsidence uh, right here over four months. Then what we did, because we had that LIDAR information, we, could, we said, you know what, we only have one pass of LIDAR. People think, well, maybe we need two passes of LIDAR to take a look at how things have changed. But we thought, well, wait a second. When you build a highway and you go to engineering specifications, you're going to have different slope embankment grades uh, according to whether or not you're on bedrock or next to a pond or, or, or an unconsolid terrain. And those typically range from, I think it's three to one, four to one, six to one. They're not often made one to one, 45 degree angle, no. But, so what we did then is we took the LIDAR data and we applied it against what we thought what expect, expectations for engineering design so we could identify over steepened embankments across the whole of Highway 3 and specifically say, you know, how many over steepened embankments are there? That's a very useful application because then the Department of Transport could say, you know what, we now know we have 250 sections that are over steepened, we need to address that. You could actually calculate the volume of sediment that you're going or volume of blast rock that you're going to need and then go to get the money to make those repairs. Now we can actually match the INSAR to the LIDAR. This is, the te this is one of the test sections that, La that uh, Lucas is working on, and we had worked in collaboration with Lucas uh, uh, in terms of looking at uh, temperature data at those sites. Just some other really interesting applications that came out of it. Okay, so this is the actual uh, LIDAR uh, elevation across the road, and you can see that's about a, a 20 centimeter difference which is here. Now what we did is we looked at something called LIDAR intensity. And the reason we did that, we said, you know what? We bet that the different uh, dates at which the road were patched are going to show up with different intensity. Essentially, we're going to be able to date the, pa the, 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 the patchwork because if you don't have documentation of when it was last patched, maybe there's a surrogate way to figure this out. So this section here is on bedrock, and that would be this section right here. It has an intensity of a particular one, and you can see the different test sections have different intensities. This one here relates to this one, and as I just said, you have about 20 centimeters. This is the most recently patched section. We also know, if you know the date of when that was patched, you know how much subsidence you've had during that time. So it's probably two years old, <laughs> and uh, 10 centimeters of subsidence each year. Okay, I'm going to go to the, the fourth example, third example, which are icings, aka, or also known as alfais, naled, glaciations, quo, uh, in the Claycho term as well. Uh, what I really think is interesting is that tequo is permafrost and quo are the icings. Um, so they are winter overland flow, accumulation of ice sheets. This is a picture taken in the fall. This is what it looks like in spring. This is what we're talking about in terms of overland flow. You see that on lakes as slush, but it occurs on land as well. And it's a transport hazard, a significant transport hazard. This is an example in the Denali uh, uh, National Park. Uh, this happens both on, on, uh, on, on all-weather roads, on 
winter roads. And I think with increasing hydro hydrological flow, we're gonna, we, we could very well see quite a bit of this. So uh, we've applied this against uh, 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 um, the winter, uh, w winter road. Uh, I'm just going to show a couple other examples. Remember, the winter road is not an ice road. It's a winter road. There are portages. It goes over land as well. Um, these, these are examples of problem portages, and the problems occur because of water flow. This is actually an old part of, uh, an old part of not necessarily the, the Tinkatibit to Kuwaita Road, but it's now uh, a stream channel, water flows through here, and the icing builds up here. This one flows through here, icing builds up here. This one's flowing down through here, icing builds up in here. And then this is actually a control site, so there's no icing build up there. Just Quickly, it's not too important. This, we're, we're actually uh, looking at the uh, snow accumulation over the course of the entire season. These are air temperatures. You can see the air temperatures going up at particular times. And all this is just, for example, showing, this is just saying that when you remove the snow, which is what they do, you can get it to freeze quicker. Remember, this line, when it hovers at zero, means that the freezing is still occurring. It's called the zero curtain. You see when you're off road, Look at this, this is what, uh, 120 centimeters, it basically didn't freeze. And here too, at 60 centimeters, it just froze here in March. Well, obviously when you clear the road, you want to get this to freeze quicker. The winter road opened on, uh, I think it was um, January 28th for trucking. At that point, it had actually frozen to 60 centimeters. Uh, yeah, that's correct. And it hadn't, cro it hadn't yet frozen at 120. And of course, continued movement of that allows it to freeze further. This is an example of an icing that occurred on the road. This occurred on December 4th. It hadn't been officially opened yet. They wouldn't know that the icing occurred because nobody was there. So we had a camera looking at that and we saw the flow. Another flow, and so what's very interesting, of course, is that flow is related to increase in air temperatures. It's still well below zero, but you get a warming and the water is released and it flows onto the road. So we even identified it thermally in the ground as a, as a latent heat effect. There's another one right here as well. This is another, another overland flow that occurred on January the 3rd. And the last one that we see thermally is one that we actually, they actually did a maintenance flood and we see that thermally as well on the road as well. So what does industry do when they're doing road selection and they're thinking about this? Well, typically what they might do is to say, well, we, we want to put, uh, we're looking at a proposed road here, so we'll fly it. We'll go and take a look at what it looks like in June and we'll, look at, or, or, and we'll look at the snow cover and we'll look at the ice cover and we'll make a decision as whether or not that's a good place to do that. So we thought, wait a second, why just look at one road selection? Let's just look everywhere. Why look at one year if you could look for like 30 year history? So we went to Landsat imagery to see if we could pick these up, pick up the icings across the whole region and of course we can. So what we see here is icing distribution. This is just from 2007. So like I said, okay, well that's fine. You know, this looks like it's fine, no problem. But this is the distribution that builds up between 2007 and 2013. Now you have a probability of occurrence. You have a risk that you can address and say, well, what is the risk of having icings on this? And so what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll fill this out for the entire Landsat history, have about 30 years for that region. And so this is quite significant, again, when it comes back to road selection. These are, the, again, the different uh, alternative road selections for the winter road uh, to uh, Wati. And there's icing development here, there's icing development here and here. So you can make some decisions again with regards to where you might best plan uh, a, a road route in regards to, uh, to overland flow. And like I said, lastly, I would only just say that we have a distribution of data now, air temperature data, ground temperature data, and this is a very useful data set. Uh, it's always available. You ask, you know, it's all, uh, it, it goes out the door whenever, whenever it's needed, and it's needed often enough. This is a team of uh, researchers, scientists, and, uh, and, and people involved, and, and this is part of what, I, what we call tracks, transportation risk in the Arctic to climatic sensitivity. And so I'd just like to acknowledge uh, the range of uh, GNWT uh, people on the team, Carlton again, uh, uh, Ed Hove at, uh, at EB Engineering, EBA Engineering, a Tetra Tech company, and Luke Sorensen at BGC. And uh, uh, both, uh, it's quite a team, both at the Geological Survey of Canada and the Canada Centre for Remote Sensing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry.